When movies get stuck in development hell, there's a good chance that they stay there. Over the years, innumerable movies have been started only to see any effort towards them dwindle away. Some movies, like one based off of Metal Gear Solid or a live-action Akira movie, seem unlikely to ever get made. But, as Francis Ford Coppola proved with Megalopolis, which has been on the back burner for almost 50 years, there's always hope. In this video, I want to take a look at the movies that were in development hell for long periods of time, some as many as several decades, before they finally got made. Not all of them did well, but the fact that they got done at all is a miracle. In almost all cases, development was touch and go until somehow, someone found the wherewithal to make one final push and get it done. Deadpool is probably one of the more famous development hell stories in Hollywood. Deadpool was part of a slate of projects that Arzen Studios announced that they would co-produce with Marvel in 2000 alongside a Black Panther movie starring Wesley Snipes, a Captain America movie, and a Thor TV show. Nothing came of it and Deadpool moved to New Line Cinema in 2004, which is when Ryan Reynolds got attached to it. What sparked his interest, and soon his obsession, was reportedly a reference to him in an issue of Cable and Deadpool. But New Line had no idea what to do with it, so it got moved to 20th Century Fox, which owned X-Men. Instead of doing a solo movie, they put a version of him in X-Men Origins Wolverine, which was a critical flop, but did alright commercially. It was enough that they decided to develop a solo Deadpool movie with Reynolds as the lead. Lauren Schuler Donner was in charge of production, and she wanted to reboot Deadpool to focus more on his comic book personality. The project ran into several issues. One, it was impossible to do a Deadpool movie as anything but rated R, otherwise they would have to tone down the character quite a bit. R-rated movies based on comic books were successful at this point. 300, V for Vendetta, and Kick-Ass proved that. But none were closely aligned with a major property like X-Men as much as Deadpool was. Another issue was finding the right team. The movie cycled through several writers and directors. David Goyer, Rhett Reese, Paul Wernick, Robert Rodriguez, and others. The final writing team ended up being Reese and Wernick with Tim Miller, who came up on the VFX side, hired as director. This was quite a risk, as this was Tim Miller's first feature film. Then, the biggest monkey wrench of them all. See, this all happened in 2011. Something else that happened in 2011 was that a Reynolds Green Lantern movie came out and landed with a thud, critically and commercially. The project, which was going as smooth as movie could go, was suddenly on a knife's edge. Fox tried the PG-13 route again, but everyone decided against it. Fox gave Miller and Reynolds a million dollars to make some test footage to try and convince them. This was Miller's expertise, but the test footage did not do that job at that time. But the project never really died, thanks to Miller having some big backers. Mainly James Cameron and David Fincher, both friends of Miller and all three fans of the tech side of filmmaking. The thing that helped the most was that the test footage got leaked in July 2014. It got universal acclaim from fans that had been waiting for this kind of news for years. A couple months later, Fox gave in. They gave Deadpool a 2016 release date and made a deal with Reynolds, Miller, Reese Wernick, and Simon Kinberg, who joined on as producer. They could make the movie the exact way that they wanted to, but they would do so with a budget of less than $60 million. That was all they needed. Deadpool was one of the better comic book movies and broke multiple records, trouncing already high expectations and proving that superhero movies could be done well for relatively cheap. We still don't know who leaked the footage, but whoever did it did the Lord's work. James Cameron wanted to do Alita Battle Angel ever since Guillermo del Toro turned him on to the joys of manga in the 1990s. Hell, the domain name for the movie was first registered to Fox on March 30th, 2000. The movie was based on the Battle Angel Alita manga that originally ran from 1990 to 1995. It was written by Yugido Kishiro, who, I'm going to note, is a fan of Blue Oyster Cult. I mean, come on, Destinova, Nova, The Imaginal Spotty, The Hook and Cross, The Timing Tracks as well, as BOC's Imaginal's album was released in 1988, just a couple of years prior to Battle Angel Lolita starting publication. Obviously, the man has good taste. Anyways, Cameron wanted to turn the manga into a movie, but it was always competing with the other movie that Cameron wanted to make, Avatar. Throughout the 2000s, whenever he spoke of what he was working on, he spoke of them in tandem. Fox, no doubt desperate for their titanic hitmaker to make anything, was happy to let him do whatever he wanted. Cameron wanted both to be trilogies, which explains why the name was changed from Battle Angel Alita to Alita colon Battle Angel. As Cameron put it, they could then do quote, Alita Fallen Angel, and then Alita, you know, Avenging Angel, and then Alita whatever, end quote. 
The issue with Alita was never money, but time. Because of the size of each production, Cameron could only focus on one, despite efforts to the contrary. But it makes sense that he personally chose Avatar, considering he'd been developing it since the mid-90s. Cameron was reticent to hand the project off, saying he loved it too much, but considering how time-consuming Avatar was, he had to. Help came in the form of Robert Rodriguez, probably one of the most resourceful filmmakers out there. It's not for nothing that the guy was able to make a feature film, an action feature film, on a $7,000 budget. Rodriguez took Cameron's 186-page script and hundreds of pages of notes and turned it into a shooting script that both were happy with. Both men, fans of the technical side of filmmaking, had also been looking to collaborate on a movie for years and this was their chance. Cameron was effusive in his praise for Rodriguez, saying, quote, This project is near and dear to me, and there's nobody I trust more than Robert, with his technical virtuosity and rebel style to take over the directing reins, end quote. Production began in October of 2016 and wrapped in February of 2017. It got alright reviews when it was released, though it's unlikely that it made its money back at the box office. Still, Cameron and Rodriguez refused to let the movie go, and as of April 2023, the sequel is in active development, according to Cameron's producer, Don Landau, with Rodriguez on board as director. Honestly, it's a good, fun movie, and I'm hoping that the sequel gets made sooner rather than later. Mad Max Fury Road had a chaotic path to the big screen. The idea of a Mad Max movie that's an extended chase sequence came to Miller in the late 1980s, but it wasn't until the late 90s that the ideas became concrete. That's when, according to a New York Post article, quote, Miller conceived of a story where violent marauders were fighting not for oil or material goods, but for human beings, end quote. He probably didn't think that it would take two decades for his vision to make it to the big screen. Unusually, Fury Road started with storyboards instead of a screenplay. It was supposed to be a feast for the eyes, so visuals had to come first. Miller and a team of five storyboard artists came up with around 3,500 panels that detailed the movie from start to finish. When the movie started pre-production in 2000, Mel Gibson was still slated to play Max Rokotansky, while Sigourney Weaver was up for the role that would become a broader Furiosa. Then a delay came in the most unlikely form, 9-11. In Miller's words from a Time Out interview, quote, and then with 9-11, the American dollar collapsed against the Australian dollar and our budget ballooned, end quote. Later, the war in Iraq would cause problems with the proposed shooting location in Namibia. At the time, he also agreed to direct another movie, the animated Happy Feet. All the digital shooting facilities were booked, so he left Fury Road for the moment and spent four years on Happy Feet. By the time the movie came out, Mel Gibson's reputation had crashed and burned. Even if it hadn't, both seemed reticent to continue with Gibson as Max considering his age. But Miller refused to give up on Fury Road. Pre-production continued slowly apace and he started looking at other actors to play Max. Tom Hardy, Army Hammer, Jeremy Renner, Eminem, Heath Ledger, Eric Bana, and others were considered. He even considered changing up the format of the movie, entertaining the idea of making it a quote-unquote 3D anime feature. According to an MTV article from 2009, quote, Miller is resurrecting the idea as an R-rated stereoscopic anime flick for theatrical release, end quote. That never ended up happening, of course. After Tom Hardy was chosen, production was supposed to begin in August of 2010, but heavy rainfall in their first choice, Broken Hill, in New South Wales delayed it. They instead shifted back to Namibia, where the new start date was given as November 2011. Filming would not begin until July 2012, a decade and a half after the ideas concretized in Miller's mind. Filming wrapped in December of the same year, though some extra shots were still necessary. All the shots would not be in until December of 2013, after what was a very long, very painful shoot. But that's for another video. When he was developing The Lord of the Rings in the 1990s, Peter Jackson also wanted to make a Hobbit movie. The initial plan was actually to do one Hobbit movie and two Lord of the Rings movies instead of a proper trilogy. That plan was shelved thanks to rights disputes. Saul Zantz had the production rights to The Hobbit, while United Artists had the distribution rights. Harvey Weinstein, who was trying to produce the Lord of the Rings movies back then, was unable to secure the rights, which is probably for the best. He and his brother tried to get Jackson to condense the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy into one movie, which is what led Jackson to New Line Cinema. Jackson focused on the Lord of the Rings, thinking that he would eventually get back to The Hobbit. Eventually, would be more than a decade away, thanks to him and the Tolkien estate suing New Line over the studio withholding money from them. The relationship deteriorated, but after New Line suffered some flops in the mid-2000s, CEO Bob Shea was eager to get back on good terms with Jackson. 
Also, MGM, which owned United Artists and thus held the distribution rights for The Hobbit, would not partner with New Line unless Jackson was involved. In 2007, New Line and MGM had Jackson come on as executive producer for the, at the time, two planned Hobbit movies. Each movie got a $150 million budget, meaning that the two movies' budgets were larger than the combined $281 million budget for the Lord of the Rings trilogy. In 2008, Guillermo del Toro was brought on to direct. He and Jackson had considered making a Halo movie in 2005, and while that fell through, both were eager to work with each other on a project. And it was a solid working relationship. Both men respected each other's works, and Del Toro dove right in. He flew between LA and New Zealand every three weeks, caught up on Tolkien and Tolkien studies, read up on World War I, and wrote as much as 12 hours a day, balancing all of that with working on the designs and effects for the film with the Weta Workshop and Weta Digital. Del Toro also wanted to push the limit with animatronics, only wanting to use CGI in cases where it was necessary, like with Gollum. They figured that they would need 370 days for the total shoot. But in 2010, thanks to delays from MGM, who was suffering financial troubles, Del Toro left the project. In his words, quote, There cannot be any start dates until the MGM situation gets resolved. We have designed all the creatures, we've designed the sets and the wardrobe. We have done animatics and planned every lengthy action sequence, end quote. But nothing could be done until MGM gave them the go-ahead. Creative differences can be an issue on a movie, but that was not the case here. Jackson and writer Philippa Boynes were happy with Del Toro's work, and I don't think that Jackson was keen on another grueling shoot. Other directors, like David Yates and Neil Blomkamp, were considered, but within a couple of weeks, it was reported that Peter Jackson was in negotiations to direct the movies. Jackson had zero time to prepare. In his words, quote, Because Guillermo Del Toro had to leave and I jumped in and took over, we didn't wind the clock back a year and a half and give me a year and a half prep to design the movie, which was different to what he was doing. It was impossible, and as a result of it being impossible, I just started shooting the movie with most of it not prepared at all. You're going onto a set and you're winging it. You've got these massively complicated scenes, no storyboards, and you're making it up there and then on the spot, end quote. Whereas the Lord of the Rings was a well-oiled machine, The Hobbit was more like a machine whose parts didn't fit together, kept falling off, and the entire contraption was held together with duct tape. That's best evidenced by them tacking on a third film in 2012 turning it into a trilogy just six months before the first movie was due to be released. The movie still made bank though, so the studio and distributors were happy. A live action Barbie movie had been floated around as an idea for as far back as the 1980s, though that incarnation never got particularly far. All there was was one short blurb in a 1986 LA Times article, quote, Barbie, the leggy Mattel doll, shows her owner that all of her dreams can come true, end quote. This idea went nowhere, and the Barbie movie was put on ice for decades. It wasn't until 2009 that development was renewed, though it would be a winding road to the release. There would be some false starts before anyone started getting attached to the project, and once people did get attached to it, there would be even more false starts. Mattel got more serious about turning Barbie into a live-action movie in 2014. They invited several people to pitch them on an idea, and the winning one ended up being from writer Jenny Bix and production duo Walter Parks and Laurie McDonald. But that didn't work out, and in 2015, Diablo Cody was brought on to rewrite the script. But that didn't work out either, as evidenced by Sony soliciting rewrites and scripts from other writers, including Burt V. Royal and Hilary Winston. Around this time, Amy Schumer was brought on to play Barbie and her sister, Kim Caramel, to write, though that would not last. Diablo Cody also left the project in 2017 over creative differences, and Olivia Milch was brought in to replace her as a writer. At the same time, they replaced Schumer with Anne Hathaway to be directed by Alethea Jones. But there's no way that it could have been that easy. In 2018, Mattel went through a shakeup and Inan Kreese was made CEO. Kreese, seeing how well Marvel was doing on the filmic front, wanted to emulate their success and went all in on trying to kickstart his own MCU, the Mattel Cinematic Universe. He hired Robbie Brenner, a longtime producer, to oversee the movie. The same year, Barbie's rights went from Sony to Warner Brothers, and with that brought a change in actors, writers, producers, and directors. Warner started talking to Margot Robbie to play Barbie with Patty Jenkins as director. Chris himself was intent on getting Robbie to be Barbie, though it wouldn't be until 2019 that she was officially confirmed. That still led two very important slots to fill, director and writer. They would find both in Greta Gerwig, hot off of Little Women at the time. Gerwig initially only came on as a writer, but by 2021, also agreed to direct the movie. 
In a move that's wildly contradictory to most other studios, Mattel decided that they would be hands off and give Gerwig and her partner, Noah Baumbach, who co wrote the script, full creative control. That meant that sometimes they would do things that Mattel wouldn't agree with, such as the corporate criticism. In those cases, Mattel, to their credit, gritted their teeth and went along with it. They were, of course, handsomely rewarded in the end. You need to be a little bit mad to do a stop motion horror movie. And you need to be really mad to stick with it for over 30 years, even suffering a mental breakdown in the final stretch. Phil Tippett is nothing if not mad, as well as genius, something that's reflected in Mad God. If you don't know his name, you know his work. The holographic chess game in Star Wars, the Adats and the Tauntauns on Hoth in Empire Strikes Back, the bugs in Starship Troopers, and more were a result of Tippett imparting his magic onto the movies he worked on as one of Hollywood's leading visual effects designers. For his troubles, he's been nominated for half a dozen Academy Awards and won two. But like with many people that work behind the scenes on movie, Tippett got the itch to make his own movie, or in this case, follow his vision, which he described as, quote, a Milton-esque world of monsters, mad scientists, and war pigs, end quote. Production on the weird, wild, horror stop motion movie Mad God proved to be a rough ride. Keep in mind what had to be done for the movie. Since it was all stop motion and there was no CGI, all the characters, sets, and effects had to be crafted by hand. Movement was done by entering the frame, making tiny adjustments, leaving the frame, taking a shot, and repeating. And you're not just adjusting one thing. You need to adjust everything in the frame that'll be moving. It's a time-consuming process, if nothing else. After working on Jurassic Park and seeing the shifting winds in terms of tech, Tippett put Mad God on hold for a long time, 20 years. In an interview with Variety, Tippett called the years more of an incubation period. In his words, quote, Over the next 20 years, I studied a number of things like art history and literature. There's a lot of Dante and Milton in the film. And then I really got into Freud and particularly The Red Book by Carl Jung, end quote. Tippett understood that Mad God was a passion project, not a moneymaker. In his words, quote, all of the friends I've shown it to have liked it a great deal, but every single one of them has felt the need to tell me this film is not for everybody, end quote. Tippett said that he relied on his own unconscious to drive filmmaking. It nearly broke him. Talking about the Red Book by Jung, Tippett said, quote, he wrote it over a period of 16 years and it drove him insane. A similar thing happened to me. I went down this psychological path that took me into this bizarre world that ended up in the psych ward. It was that kind of experience where, I guess, I became a method filmmaker. I got lost in this unconscious vision, end quote. It would take a well-funded Kickstarter campaign to see his 83-minute dream to completion, but it eventually would see completion, which is a feat in and of itself. In an interview with Fabulous Magazine, Tippett quoted Roger Ebert saying, quote, Computer graphics look real but feel fake, and stop motion looks fake but feels real, end quote. If nothing else, Mad God certainly evokes feelings. Francis Ford Coppola first started to envision what would become Megalopolis in 1977, the beginning of what would become a nearly five-decade odyssey of trying to bring his vision to the big screen, which would eventually see him put $120 million of his own money into it. Coppola didn't start actively developing Megalopolis until 1983, putting together hundreds of pages of notes. But while he kept working on this project, other movies commanded his time. One from the heart, the Outsiders, Rumblefish, The Godfather Part 3, Bram Stoker's Dracula, Jack, and more. Coppola was a busy, busy man after all. He kind of had to be, as he had a lot of debts to pay off. He was also a perfectionist though. Megalopolis was near and dear to him, and no doubt he wanted to get it perfect. The goal was to take the profits from those movies and put them towards Megalopolis, though things didn't quite work out that way. In the early 2000s, he made some progress, moving on to doing table reads with actors like Russell Crowe, Robert De Niro, Leonardo DiCaprio, and others, though a full script still eluded him at that point. He had concept art commissioned and even started shooting second unit footage of New York, which had to be reshot after 9-11. By 2002, he also decided that he would self-finance the movie, not wanting any interference from studios. Eventually, production ground to a halt for more than a decade. He had his winery and other projects to focus on, but Megalopolis was always there on the back burner. In 2019, he decided to take the plunge and put his money where his mouth is. He sold a part of his winery and put more than $100 million of his own money into the movie. Filming finally began in November of 2022 and wrapped in March of 2023. Production was apparently disjointed and difficult, though to be fair, the man did make Apocalypse Now. Everyone kind of knew what they were getting themselves into. 
The movie has proved divisive with critics, which honestly only makes it seem more interesting. Lionsgate agreed to distribute it, and only time will tell where Megalopolis will land in Coppola's overall filmography. At the very least, however, he deserves respect for seeing it to a satisfying conclusion, the end of a nearly 50-year-old dream. It's a surprise that any movie gets made at all, considering issues come up all the time and sometimes those issues delay production for decades or worse indefinitely. Still, the directors, writers, actors, producers, and crew that stick with these movies to their end certainly deserve some praise. There's a dogged pursuit, a certain madness here that is, if nothing else, admirable.